Hi, everyone. And today I have Leo and Marius back again to share the latest advancements of symbolic AI. So today we're going to show you something cool, how to use symbolic AI to create personas of people that you can chat with and they can chat with one another and how you can use symbolic AI to go on the terminal or command prompt and basically converse with your documents with GPT freely. And that's really a very practical thing. So maybe we have a few words first from Leo or Marius. You want to say anything about uh, what you want to share today? Yeah. So hi. Yeah, thanks, uh, John, for the introduction. And thanks for having us again. Um, yeah, we're really thrilled. We kind of, you know, stick our heads together again, uh, worked on, had, you know, this uh, amazing also updates all now coming from uh, OpenAI again, and we immediately integrated all, you know, the, the new tools, all the new models and so on. And uh, the cool part is now really things start to come together because we, when we started with the project, it was like always, the, especially the context limit was a huge problem for us. Uh, and, and, you know, dealing with that, that you can, you know, start a real workflow or anything with it, right, it was really cumbersome. And now that kind of these things are starting to pan out, uh, now it's really getting in a, into also in a kind of semi-research, semi-productive way. And this is actually really cool to, to showcase. So, yeah, Leo, if you want also some words or otherwise I would start. Oh, it's okay. basically subscribe to, uh, to what you said. <laughs> Uh, please support uh, GitHub, uh, give them more stars so that people adopt it more. And if not, let's go straight into the showcase. I'm actually quite excited because um, this is something quite cool. All right, please go ahead, Morris. Okay. okay so, so can you make it a bit uh, larger, larger, the size? Sure. Uh, the font, sorry. Just increase a bit the font okay, if you can. Like this? Yes. Yeah. More? Less? Yeah. No, it, it's fine. It's fine. So let's keep it like this. To also keep some overview, yeah. So most of the changes or many things uh, that uh, happened are in the extended package. This is where we always try new experimental stuff, think about new ideas, but some of them start to mature uh, also to like core features that remain in the framework. Um, what we have, for instance, now here, we're going to look at the persona builder today, dialect system, API executor, and uh, a specific uh, persona, if you want to, so, uh, that we already created. But uh, without any further ado, let's dive in. So first of all, the text-to-speech update, which, which came out, is already amazing because now we can basically, apart from initializing our framework, we can basically um, use this te text-to-speech model at any place, uh, point in time, and just, you know, uh, generate hello world and so on. Uh, this is going uh, to the TTS uh, layer in the in the back end of OpenAI because they only provided an uh, API call in this case. And uh, you, somewhere here on my file system should be you now uh, Marius or so Marius TTS. Uh, yes, and, yes, there it is. Exactly. So yeah, basically this is just, you know, a um, synthesizing a speech, but we were going to look into this in, in later details uh, down the line. Do you get to configure the voice or is a default voice by opening Yeah, there, there's several voices like, uh, uh, so you just have some presets like four or five, five voices or so like, uh, I don't know, echo uh, or what was it there? I kind of forgot the voices, but anyhow, yeah. there, there are some, some voices. So it's quite cool. Voices. Like when you couple this with the persona, you can get like Alexa style stuff. You can. Yeah, exactly. Can, yeah, exactly. You, you that's how... The AI will talk to you back like a human. Yes, and we're going to listen to that <laughs> also later on yeah. to the conversation. So, but maybe less than, yeah, more than just Hello World. All right, cool. So, Let's look at the next part um, on conversations. So, yeah, um, apart now from this, uh, you know, text to speech, what you can do, and we will look at, you know, some more details down the line and listen to something apart from just Hello World. Um, uh, is this conversation class. I mean, the conversation class, if you think about uh, OpenAI, you always go to their website, chat GPT, and then start interacting with it. Nowadays, you know, you can also search some stuff in, on the web and do some more elaborate things. But uh, fundamentally, I mean, the framework also has search and all this built in, but fundamentally this also kind of changed how we work on it because we don't go to chat GPT on the website. We basically, when we create, let's say a project or so, we want to start a conversation. We have like this no Jupyter notebook or something like that where we always persist our chats, right? And we can, for instance, use this conversation class to interact with it 
uh, and then chat with it and see, you know, how can we prompt things, ask for suggestions, code improvements, and so forth. Um, yeah, and this is basically uh, that. Then we have also like, um, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we can utilize uh, Selenium, which we already showcased in the past, where it's just a crawler to get some data now from the internet. And for instance, we can initialize our conversation class. We covered this in the earlier videos, but now this is also important for the personas that will follow up uh, later on. So what we do here is now basically we just you know initialize this with some data that we just scraped uh, from our extensity AI website, as you see here, and this is you know the entire thing here. Um, yeah. So let me just close this again, and now we can obviously ask questions, and you know we can sit it through uh, uh, and see what you know. When, when we do a project proposal, for instance, or so, and about fundings, development, and other stuff, we could like, you know, prompt it and now we generate happily some, some text uh, on top of that. Back end, yes. this is doing retrieval augmented generation, right? So when you yes. put in your data, it will split into chunks automatically. Uh, you can specify the kind of style you want to split in, but um, what it does is that it does embedding and then indexes each chunk. And what you can do when you ask the question with the data next time is that it will do retrieval augmented generation, find the most similar chunks to your query, and, and then use it for the context to generate your output. Is, is that um, is that more or less? The exactly. That's, that's, yeah. that's essentially what, what it, it does. And uh, there is basically that there are multiple functionalities and how you can use this. You can obviously give it a list of files and you know you can just use all the list of files. Uh, in the context, which is we're going to try then um, to store this uh, in the memory. This stores it directly in the memory, but obviously if you have already some indexed database or some pine cone, whatever running in your background, you can give it an index name. At the beginning, it's just none, but you can just give it something and then it will create happily an index for you. And then you have your entire, you know, whatever GitHub, Wikipedia thing, what you have want to have. And you're basically having now um, your own even search query optimized version, like we will see this also maybe later on the terminal, but the idea is like when we query then the, the index, it's gonna give it a basically a refined query based on your memory and so on, that it can also find some stuff that is, uh, you know, re related or latently or remotely uh, um, kind of related to your current uh, memory and to your current interactions. Um, so yeah, this is actually really cool. And then you can do the recall uh, and, you know, basically uh, ask it to, you know, whatever its opinion is on, on the uh, subject at hand. Um, nice. So these are the basic functionalities. And this is how we also use it when we maybe try some code refinement. We already had some experiments where we just, you know, generate our own library, parts of our own library, and then just correct it ourselves. Because obviously we can just trust these models. And then you go back and refine and try again in the loop. So yeah, you see that you kind of wrote a pro project proposal. I obviously don't copy paste it, just you know, look at it, uh, take what you, you need and, uh, and refine afterwards. Um, but what this enables now um, down the line oh, sorry, is- Before uh, you, you move on, I uh, just want to highlight something. Uh, could you go up a, a bit? Yes. Uh, scrub. Yeah, so basically if let's say you, you, uh, you, you download the package Symbolic AI, all you need to do is to call this conversation and you can instantly talk to any site you want, any GitHub repository and so on. This conversational wrapper will basically do the job for you so that you can converse with your data. It even stores the past few conversational history so that you can ask follow-up questions. So if you want an off-the-shelf yep, uh, if, if an off uh, usage, of like retrieval augmented generation over any web data or even your own documents, uh, you can just use the conversational, uh, use the conversation function here. Yeah. Uh, yeah no? ju 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 just to add uh, something, if you wouldn't add anything, so uh, if you don't add any data or any indexing or whatever, it's literally the browser conversation that you would get with uh, the model. Yeah. It's exactly. just for, for us, is as programmers, it's easier to perform conversation. I mean, formatting in, in browser, it's it's really bad. And uh, uh, here I can just tab something and nicely arrange the text and so on. I mean, it's easier to, to do this. So at least to us, instead of just going to the chat GPT uh, page, then you just use it here and it's the same model. So if you yeah. don't add anything, it's just the same. 
as as you would get in the browser. And the experiment uh, IPy notebook here, for instance, is exactly what what it is. So we have multiple mul multiple projects, multiple experiment files, and so on. And then we just start these conversations with, and we check that in into the repo then um, to to have the trace. Yeah. So that's basically conversation. Not nothing new or special here. This has been long in the framework. But what you now can do, and we will reuse this concept um, later on because. Uh, I want to introduce you to like personas. Um, and and before doing that, I also want to um, utilize, let's say, some other sources of data. and and one one cool thing is, I mean, you saw before that we used selenium to to crawl the the web. But imagine you would have, I don't know, some URLs. Um, I, I mean, we we already have now retrieval augmented generation. We have on one hand side, uh, you know, maybe some endpoint that we want to reach. Um, and but we haven't programmed it in our library, and uh, we kind of you know experiment a lot all the time with with this you know code generation and stuff like that. And we were thought, can we create let's say an API executor with an API builder that can basically you know do this on the fly, just prompt it, like you know fetch data from some endpoint. Uh, this will take a lot now. We'll just try it 20 seconds or so if that it might fail even. Uh, because what it does here, it just takes this prompt. It now basically starts triggering the API builder and the API builder will try to generate code on the fly. Oh, it actually worked um, from the start. And then it generates the full code, how to interact to so request the website. In this case, it's maybe not the, the most sophisticated uh, um, use case. But basically, it now generates uh, code and executes that code and returns the data then afterwards. So we should have, um, when we look at the raw data, maybe um, somewhere here, we should have something from from this endpoint. So yeah, we have the yeah website from Yannick Kilker uh, fully, you know, pulled. Um, so this is cool. You can also say like filter out the name or, you know, and, and this is actually really cool because we could say like uh, what this has is basically we call this self-referential structures uh, in, in programming. Um, this construct knows that it has its own construct. So it knows that there exists functions, uh, symbolic AI specifically exists, right? And it can use functions as we use functions when we extract data. So we can basically tell it, uh, and extract, um, I don't know, uh, the plain text. And the idea here is now, this might take longer now, uh, the idea is that now it programs something where it uses the function class, prompts the own function class, executes that, and then basically returns whatever the result is. So the LLM is using its own, like its own LLM to, to you know, do the, the heavy lifting. And if we look at the code again, um, we should see something like, you know, uh, we have here, where is it? Um, beautiful soup. So what, what did it figure it out? So let's see. In this case, it's use beautiful soup, funny. Uh, but okay, yeah, it can do that too. And use that to get the text there. Yeah, okay, good, smart move. Mm -hmm. um, but you could also, I don't know, um, try it again and then basically you would basically uh instruct it that it extracts maybe the first name or something like that yeah extract. actually this is how i use uh, gpt to create my own web scraper i just type in my intent and then out comes the code then you check whether it works exactly uh, here i just have a question uh yeah. how does it know how to use the symbolic ai functions because it's <clears> not uh, widely available on the web definitely after the knowledge cut off yeah you, you must definitely have provided some of Definitely. course, there's a prompt and context. Exactly. So um, the the idea is here that basically now the ex uh, API executor is just executing stuff. So the API builder is is kind of trying this, and there is a try catch uh, clauses and so on, trying to you know when executing this, retrying it and so forth, and the self prompting and so on. So you have the self error um, correction built in as well, right? Exactly. exactly. Error message and prompted with the error message to generate. Exactly. The... Exactly. So it tries really a, like a more multiple stage of like recapturing ba back to to you know until it works or I mean like after three times it will fail. So if you see that it takes longer than thirty seconds, usually it failed because like it couldn't uh, you know refine it prob probably. But if you look at this for instance, there is a description here at the top, and the description is kind of like um, uh, obviously some a bit verbose. 
but the idea is that it kind of it tells that there is uh, uh, there is basically symbolic AI and it tells it that you can actually use symbolic AI and how because it says like um, somewhere in the text I don't know I can see it right now uh, it says basically uh, it's a language model it can prompt it with any query you want and you can basically here extract uh, and parse API calls in like uh, any means you want so basically now it should know that there is like symbolic AI, some AI, and that has a function. And when it uses the function, for instance, here are some examples how to use it. Uh, then it knows, right? And this from this point on, now we're just using our own bootstrapping, our own framework to to utilize that. And this alone, there are some uh, fixed parts because there's some templating going on here. So some code it shouldn't change. It's not allowed to change. But there are also some variable parts. Uh, where it generates the code in, uh, this makes it all overall more stable because we all know that you can't really generate from scratch code that works immediately in, in uh, with large language models. But with this neat tricks around with some templating and with some description and some examples, uh, it kind of figures the, the things out and, and, and uh, in a way. Now, in this case, it decided to use the function uh, or at least it, intro it introduced the the, the uh, import again, and let's see what did it do. Yeah, it goes by text, so it, it's kind of determined in this case to use beautiful soup uh, of, to extract the information. Let's see if it also succeeded or if it really uh, was a fail. I'm sorry, but uh, it seems to have a, a typo instruction and so on. Yeah, congratulations, yeah. you you didn't manage. Um, we can obviously so, so instruct it always. Quite experimental, right? I mean, I actually of course exactly. And to use this in like a real industry no, no, use no. Case because um, the code generated, it will just run without checking. So sometimes it might lead to a, a, an injection attack. Of course, that, uh, of course. Yeah, yeah. Yes, but as, it, as it, I said. Cool, yeah, it is cool how you could get the code out um, directly from a line of text. Uh, but I actually strongly recommend checking the code before running because, because this, this might lead to some uh, unforeseen yes. circumstances if you just run the code like that. Yes. I mean, also from the prompt, we are restricted it to HTTP calls and stuff like that. So it knows that it has to do API web API calls and so on. Um, the point is not about, um, you know, put this in a production system. That's why I said we're, we're in the extended realm of our, of our um, uh, framework. And we're just trying around and see where, where are the limits, right? What can we do? What, what can't we do? You see here now finally decided, uh, for instance, extract uh, and extract the function of oh, function of Sumer. Maybe I should also prompt something properly, but as you see here, extract the function of Sumer AI. Finally, at least for the showcase, it decided to create a function and you know do something with it. In this case, the data is, uh, well, I don't know. Yeah, there is no Sumer AI in there. So basically it can't extract it, but let's go back to you know the origin of data. Um, but, yeah, but I think as one, you see, one, one one thing that you have done right here is that you constrain the output that GPT generates into certain blocks. Like it will yes. definitely be the try block so that even if it fails, it will not pop up like an error message. It will be managed. Exactly. I think that's that's a very nice way of prompting because uh, GPT does work better if you constrain its outputs to a certain um, set of constraint space. And uh, in this case, we can see the beauty of it in the sense that the function that is generated would normally always run. So, yeah. So that that that's that's a that's that's something interesting. Yeah, I also think so. So if you if you find a neat way to describe your problem setting, and you, especially because what I'm also doing here, I'm I'm really focusing it down to just this section, and all mm. code has to be within this section, right? Even imports, everything it has to figure it. Put the imports, or at least put the imports here, because this is the only other optional section you can vary, right? So this is where he decided to use beautiful soup before instead of you know uh, whatever uh, uh, libraries he he has at his disposal. Um, so and and here is the only oh. section really where you can vary the interactions if you want. So, I mean the the ultimate goal would be to at least to us it, for this API builder to like if there is like a a library that you would want to use say our API. Then, like, just to reference uh, the uh, packages that our library, our uh, API relies on, like from pip install and what dependencies your library has, your API has, 
and then basically um, constrain everything to only use that. So just use the dependencies that the API has and obviously try to use the API itself where possible, mm -hmm. as the case here was using the functions. And as, as exactly so, you leads on to this, um, this exactly brings us to what like Microsoft showcased this a bit, like where we have the natural like, conversation also at some point in time where you just type in something, create me an app or whatever. And then at some point, uh, you know, it created a full-fledged mobile app in the end and everything was magically appearing and was, was done. Obviously, a lot of engineering was in the background, a lot of like just function calling and being smart about where have do you have free parameters and where do you have like some constraints and so on. And this is kind of like extending that realm a bit, like going into being a bit more loose and saying like, let's, can, let's see, what can we do with it, right? So not just extract parameters or so hyperparameters because that we can do since as you see the extract statement what we had in our framework plain text so before we saw that there was uh the entire website with images and all that stuff which maybe we can process right now and then just used one one line to extract just the full text from uh, using the language model to to get that um and this is exactly then we, uh, how we kind of utilize, if you want to, with the function calls, where we try to see how far can we get that an AI model can use an AI model to, you know, do various tasks that it was not predetermined to do in the, in the first. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, anyhow, so moving on, um, and also, or let's say moving on, but also connecting to what Leo also said is, if you have now, let's say, an agent that knows an API and another agent maybe that, you know, tries to find flaws in an API, what you can do is now, obviously, uh, one can generate some code and or use using that API and the other one can inspect that code. And this is going exactly in the directions of personas that we kind of will present in, a, in, a, in, a, in short. Um, so the idea is now... We have extracted some data. We have obviously in this case, Yana Kilcher here, but uh, could be any, anyone. And what we can also do is basically we could get some uh, additional meta information if it is uh, from scholar or so. Um, so we could, you know, maybe he has some papers or so uh, associated uh, with, with, <laughs> with his persona if you want. So, so we see that, you know, it's Google scholar with some references to some papers he wrote and colleagues. And we can now use this additional information plus the, the text description that we got from his original website, because this was the original request, fetch data from the URL here. Um, and now we can combine this into a persona, if you want, on the fly. So we have the persona builder here, which is, I can show you in a second, a templating uh, function uh, or expression that can basically uh, tell how, in, how to structure a, a genera generation of a persona and basically it hallucinates obviously all the missing parts in there. So it, it, this is a, if you want, so semi uh, originated on the data, original data and semi hallucinated part. Um, and while it's generating, let's let's take a look into it. So the persona builder is basically just, you know, starting with a description, telling it whatever this, this class is. Um, and then it basically says like, look, this is the structure that I want to have. So like a persona description, then, you know, name, dot, 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 age. These should be all the, the traits. So we want also have a personality. We want to have them like a background, uh, some education, quirks, uh, and so on. Maybe all, all this stuff should be kind of fulfilled. Um, and then we start even off with, with a template. So this is a template class of the persona, as you see here. So the persona class itself uh, is imported here. And now we have this persona um, template class. And, you know, you just actually have to generate this, um, this kind of style of description and just place it into this, uh, you know, placeholder here and maybe a name. And then it, you basically return the new persona if you want. So this is kind of like uh, the abstract view on a persona for us. Um, in the meantime, yep, Yannick was built. Uh, and uh, so see. basically uh, to just uh, summarize, you are building like a fact sheet for the person, like or basically a character trait for the person. What's the character yes. when he leaves? Height, age, all this actually is just for fun, right? I mean, you can also don't have it. It's it's more like True. um, like this is actually like an RPG character builder. Yeah, trying to yes, base on exactly. his data and try to match to some some traits. Like maybe Yannick could be very like cheerful, or Yannick could be very sarcastic. You know, based on what his exactly, his data exactly. is. 
online, all, all the archive stuff, they will use this to basically condition on it to generate this personality trait, personality traits. Uh, one question, because the data that is generated right now can fit in the context. What if there's mm -hmm. too much data to fit in the context to generate this personality? Well, we have in the conversation class uh, the sliding window approach. So basically what we also do is, and in also in our engine, what we built in is like we're streaming out of the context. And this is what, what is happening. I mean, this is also happening in, in, in ChatGPT uh, when you kind of, I mean, at least before the 128,000 token models, you kind of observe that very recent, very quickly. If you just ask it and ask it and ask it, at some point you kind of forgot what was at the top, right? So obviously this is also happening here. However, um, since we're splitting our prompts in a bit more systematic way, so we always have a system prompt versus like the user chat prompt kind of gets faded out if you want so, right? So you might lose the information what you actually asked before, but its personality should at least remain uh, uh, stable. That was the whole idea in the past when we talked about global context where it's split into a static context, dynamic context, and then we have the user queries and, and, and interactions and so on. User queries and interaction are user prompts as you now know it from, from uh, general knowledge, uh, but this we started already back then in January. So we had already thought about how can we systematically decompose uh, the prompts that we always have some instructions, right? Because this, this static context should always be available, right? Because you don't want to leave character if you want so. So this is um, how okay. we do it. Uh, we just stream out just the user. To, just need to make sure I understand this. So if let's say the amount of documents are too long, we you split into manageable chunks to con condition the generation of the persona. And then you, let's say you split into five chunks. Chunk one will get the persona generated. Then you go to chunk two and update the persona. Oh. Go to chunk three, update the persona. Is, is that how it works? Until no, no, no. It's not. It's not so smart. So it's really just. It just cuts off what it was uh, trailing before or something like that. It just oh, cuts so, off. So, so there's a it. there's a limit to the context, and then you just exactly, cut off that exactly. limit, and then the whatever limit will be used for the persona. But but this was. A, but you can do method. this with. Uh, you can you can basically achieve the same uh, result with an indexer. Because you, you can index everything into, uh, 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 let's say, Pinecone, and then you just uh, like sort of iterate over everything that's in there, retrieve, and then you do exactly what you said, which we have. But for this specific persona builder right now, uh, that's not built in. Yeah, we so have the stream I, class. There are so many ways you... that you can look at it. Yeah. There's even the streaming library uh, where you can just stream over the document if you want and build partial personas along the way, then try to recombine them. These are all the algorithmic traits that we also we talked about this in the last videos and so on, where you can use one of these built in components um, that do exactly this. So the composition of a long stream and so on, but our bet was from the start, we knew at the beginning the context is limited. It was in the beginning, it was really just. 4,000 tokens, right? Uh, then it went 8,000, was already an improvement, then 32,000 and so on. But uh, already at the 4,000 token front, we built the streaming things in there, but we knew as soon as the models get larger and larger, like this is not a problem anymore. I mean, think about now with 128,000 token models, it's like 300, quarter, 300 pages of documents of text, right? You're streaming I mean, over books right now. Exactly. Now you, yeah. when you use the streamer, you, you, book, you book streaming basic libraries. Um, Literally, yeah, like yeah. you. Yeah, I, I think this is a very interesting point because uh, this shows how we can look through large amounts of data. We have talked about two methods. One is the streaming method where you split into manageable context chunks, update whatever you want to update, like in this case, the persona, and then just keep doing this update across all the chunks. Then that's the streaming method. The other method is what Leo mentioned where you already have the chunks indexed in like maybe Pinecone mm -hmm. with the embeddings. And then what you do is you ask a question, like a traditional rec, retrieve the relevant sources and answer each of these questions. Like, what is the name? What is the age? What is the height? What is the build? And so on. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are a few ways yeah, to so... get persona. And I think both ways are fine. Uh, in this case, we are not doing the streaming. We are just cutting off at the first chunk and, and generating exactly. it. Yeah. Because that, uh, that yeah, was so, the simplest so... for, for this specific use case, because it doesn't matter, to be honest, uh, in so, this case. So, so, we, so we have both dynamic and static, if you want. So the stream is dynamic. It, it just does it uh, on the fly. Uh, the indexer is obviously static, but then you, again, iterate through it to get what you want. But it's static. It's already fixed. 
uh, once you did uh, where you when you did the indexing. So it's think about dynamic and static, like kind of yeah, way of doing it. I actually quite so, cu curious. How did they know that Yannick wears glasses? Like, do you do you encode the image as well? Because only in this image, then you see the black. Glasses. That's the next step. And, and, that's a good. That's a good step. Yeah, that's the next. We're step. working on the vision models also, but it's not not in here right now. So how so did the how did the model know it's black estimated glasses? Estimated guess. No, you you, mean, you 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 look at the Yannick Kilcher persona. Yeah. Yes. They mentioned about the the spectacles. If you look at that, look, look at, <laughs> look at yeah, that. That's uh, funny. Distinguishing features: a pair of glasses that acts to his intellectual persona. That's very true. All his videos have a black sunglass, yeah. except the recent ones on the um open AI, open assistant that he took out the glasses. That that's one of the first few times he took it out. Uh, maybe GPT already knows he's a famous person, and all this is based yeah. on. Could be yes, GPT. yes. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, and and he's also like athletic. Like he 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 does gym, and you can you can see. It, so it also knows this. <laughs> so and this yeah, is such a we... good point. One of the things that you maybe should be aware of using uh personas like this, especially if they're partially factual and partially, then you start uh, completing this this you know filling the holes if you want so. Um, because if you fill the holes with random stuff. Uh, that it doesn't know, then it's you kind of promote hallucination, especially for your tasks later on, because the personas have kind of an idea behind it. In this case, it's maybe because we full respect it with person, you know, with uh, emotions and everything like in there. Yeah, it might be good for an RPG game, but you could do a persona, obviously, also like a dev supporter, right? Or a <clears throat> quality uh, assurance uh, personnel, if you want so. You don't have to have this personnel or like I'm friendly or now I'm grumpy or whatever. Yeah, actually, it's, it's a very interesting yeah. thing. I'm looking forward to try out this persona myself because actually, you know, in this uh, paper called Generative Agents, the Interactive mm -hmm. Simulator of Human Behavior. Yeah. Yes, uh, the yes. Yeah. simulate 25 people in a, in, in, a play, uh, in a sandbox and let them interact with one another. <laughs> uh, the way they prompt it is very similar to this. Like uh, they don't have the hair color build or this. They have like personas. So like personality, they promise the personality, the name, like what do they like to do and so on. So it, it very much feels like a game. You can prompt yes. your own game characters. Mm -hmm. In this case, these are real life people, of course, with some hallucination. Let's do the Max Tanner one and see how exactly. Max Tanner talks to Yannick. Come, let, let's take a look. Yeah, let's take a look at Max Tanner, for instance. This is already a pre-built one. We have like two pre-built ones in, in the, the framework to just illustrate how it looks like. This one is like a 17 year old uh, and, and has, you know, I don't know, um, I forgot what his background was. I think he's a student or so. Uh, yeah, student because it's a student package. So yeah, basically it, it, there's some relationships also, some relationships to families, by the way, you can even link personas together. You can give them like one has a relationship to something else and they can just, you know, then it knows that there is another persona. So it's basically my mom and the other way around and so on. So this is also funny uh, to condition models. Um, but the point is now that now we have two personas and we also have this uh, introduced dialogue uh, class, which is current just for two dialogues, uh, like dialogues between two persons, but you could extend that obviously easily with some broadcasting and some smart engineering. But the point is that we have the Max and the Yannick and basically uh, we start from the left order to the right. So basically this is agent one, agent two, if you want so. Um, and here is the, basically the initial starting condition. Both of them are in, uh, like have different personalities, so they don't know the personality of the other one. So basically, even if it's the same la language model, both of them have distinct traits or distinct seeds, if you want so, uh, starting conditions. Um, and basically now one is prompting the other one. What also this dialogue system basically does is if we take a look into it, it has actually already like the text to speech built in there because we want to, I mean, it's boring to just read the text, right? In the end, in the end we want to render maybe the conversation, um, uh, but obviously you can adapt this as you want. And the idea is now what we're also doing here is basically when we're having these different bots, we're kind of wiring them together. So when we do the forward pass, we're kind of saying bot one is associated to bot two, like is basically the other person, because in general, it's just called other person. It's kind of like prompting it. But in this case, it's saying that bot one is like Yannick is talking to Max and Max is talking to Yannick and so on. And there are also some like uh, neat tricks and hacks because not all models work equally well, uh, obviously, because, uh, you know, take the other older models or so they're a bit more talkative and get confused. So we kind of like also 
specifically say this bot talks to this bot only and doesn't reference itself by name or so, right? So not, not Yannick is saying, hey, you know, Yannick, uh, it's, it's this and this. Uh, it's more like, you know, Max and it talks in the, in the other way, right? And then it's basically just, you know, an alternating conversation between these two uh, bots. We can actually uh, trigger this. Um, and then we can all follow what this one is basically asking. So the tell me more about your latest video where every instruction is a prompt, for instance, uh, was also somewhere in, in this metadata that I kind of parsed. And then, uh, hey, Max, I'm glad you asked. My uh, latest video explores the concept of prompt-based learning systems, especially it's an AI, blah, 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 and goes on. And this goes basically now for two rounds. Uh, and you, as you see, Yannick is here in this case, very verbose, uh, <laughs> explaining a lot. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. This but... is a typical chat GPT uh, kind of output, a bit more verbose and uh, a bit more formal. Yeah, that's also exactly. what the uh, researchers in the generative agents paper found that the uh, conversations tended to be a bit more formal. So yeah, we also found that we tried to in make insulting agents uh, one to each other. It's really hard to do that. Believe me, they're so so biased towards being R always formal. R R H F. You have, you have to thank yes, RSF yes. for that. Yeah. <laughs> so I think another way, um, I mean, let's say there's future work for this. Another way might be to uh, make it such that the output is only within like one sentence or two sentences so that the compositions will be crisp and, and, and clear. I mean, that, that I think GPT would adhere to it. Yeah. So right now the composition is very, very lengthy. But this highlights uh, one thing is that if you have a central manager like the dialogue system to manage two agents like that, you can essentially prevent hallucination of just like using one agent to, to hallucinate both sides because sometimes people have tried that and the same agent might talk twice and then like it might skip another agent's turn and so on. So having a central manager to manage the different parties exactly. is the way ahead and this will ensure that your conversation will always flow correctly. Exactly. So, so to, to add, to, yeah. to just to add something uh, to us, I mean, we're also interested in, in research so uh, we are experimenting with these ideas like a lot, like to us, what's, uh, I mean, what basically we think is going to be possible relatively soon is something like, if you want like an analogy, like people will, will try to build the uh, society of minds uh, that Marvin Minsky talk about, if you want, they will be just agents. Uh, I, 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 I believe, I mean, this, this is like a personal guess, like the future of gaming will be like really interesting, uh, if yeah, people yeah. jump in, in on this, it's, it's going to be like amazing. If you yes. ask me, you can just can't wait for that, your, by the way. imagine your NPCs, imagine your fellow, um, like you basically can just create your own, uh, game characters just by just typing some natural language like i want a very angry merchant then the, the immediately merchant can become angry you know you, you you could become like your own director in the game which is exactly cool. yes yeah. and, exactly and yes. Said, the central manager system i mean by this by by this terms now maybe also this this um uh, symbiote chat if you remember it is now already now old a bit if you want to quote unquote but this narration basically was already the idea was here already. Basically, this narration is the thought process, if you want to, right? So just before spouting out something or so, right, you could in, in instruct it to behave in a way uh, more insulting, more nice, more whatever, uh, talking about this or that topic more specifically. Uh, so you can use the same ideas of the Symbian chat, but we had already uh, also almost since day one. Uh, in here that kind of narrates the, the or guides basically the conversation. Symbia does not understand and asks uh, repeat uh, and give more context, right? This could be something like you want to enforce on your agents and so on. And you can use all these traits and, uh, and, and, and tricks and so on also later on in uh, the, uh, the conversation or in the personas if you want so to give them a flavor. Um, Very nice. By the way, the, video, the, the audio is rendered, I think. Hey, Yannick. Tell me more about your latest video where every instruction is a prompt. Hey Max, I'm glad you asked. My latest <laughs> video explores the concept of a prompt-based learning system. Essentially, it's an AI model that operates entirely on prompts, which are guiding instructions in natural language. This system is intriguing because it reflects a more intuitive way of human-computer interaction. Much. Okay, I mean, if you get the idea, you can listen to the next. You can send yeah, it to the cool. file if you want. <laughs> the text can become a, a a speech with a certain flavor. Like you can set the kind of um voice you want from a set of 
preset voices. Yes. And you know, so you can... I, I, I've also seen people do one step further. So basically, given the voice, you can actually get your avatar talking. So, so that 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 is that is something that I think a lot of people will be doing some use case like that because the technology is available now to do those. <laughs> but by exactly. exactly, you can really simulate two avatars and it can be quite realistic given that you can condition the avatar on the memory of what they have, like what, what they're doing right here with the uh, each individual, I would like to call it agent, uh, basically like Yannick Kilcher or Max Tanner, they have access to the documents that define um, their knowledge and they can use that to answer questions. So it feels very personalized and... I, I really think this kind of system is the way ahead for this kind of interaction, especially for for generated personas. Especially next time when you when they talk to you, they can even remember aspects of what they have talked in the past yes. and encode that into memory. And this memory is a dynamically updated memory that you can keep using in the future conversations. So I'm very excited for this. Just, just imagine that now with the text to speech and basically you can also like record your own like you can use a microphone right that basically right now you, you don't even have to text to write anything it's even more amazing because basically like at the end of this year if you want to take it like this we can start like doing experimental work with um uh, like you know what we discussed like I don't know in the beginning in March or April when we did our first session about the, having your own personal Jarvis like uh, Karpati is working on this everyone is basically working on this with much more resources but this is now achievable and conceivable it, literally you can talk to your laptop and have this uh, agent that as you said has already a memory baked in and you just through the microphone, you talk to 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 this agent, and uh, it replies back to you, and it can it, it keeps going back and forth. And this is like amazing. This is like this. This was not possible last year. Yes. Yeah. And I I I do think that this whole evolution of stuff is is so fast, and actually, it's very in line with what I liked a lot, which is memory and usage of memory for fast adaptable agents. I think exactly. this is uh this is the time to to really do stuff on it. So exciting! And it's amazing because it's also like all of it is also that's that's the nice thing about this neurosymbolic thing. But because the the neural things are really expensive to to host to do and whatever. But you, you, you know you have to be like a big lab to to have the resources to to do some yeah. new uh you know algorithm development and so on. But actually the symbolic part is cheap now with especially with these tools if you think about it. Because you can now just use classical algorithms, like I mean, memory systems and so on, like sliding windows, all these traits and so on, tree search and so on. This is not nothing new, right? But now yeah. combining both together, this is give, giving also a thrive of innovation because this is like a huge new realm of of possibilities. But you just yeah. have to engineer, basically. You can um, mark my words for this. Uh, I think memory, if we solve the way we encode and retrieve memory, it will get us more than halfway towards AGI. Because it's so important yes. for fast learning yes. agents. We, we, we need to go beyond cosine similarity. I mean, people have yeah. ha, have to go beyond cosine similarity. We, yes. need, we need better yes. in code. <laughs> there are models. There are models. But most of the people, like 80-20 rule, they are still using cosine, which is really bad. Don't use cosine, please. <laughs> yeah, what what other methods are there if you don't use cosine similarity now? Uh, there are there are models which basically perform for you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, anyway, that's oh, well, it, like to... it's a it's a trait of like also speed and so on. This is always sometimes because it's like what do you want to achieve? Yeah, well, I like to. So, think John, that, if, you, uh, if, session, if you if you if you have if sorry, yeah, no, I other say actually, uh, we do have another thing we have to showcase the terminal one. Uh, however, I think due to the uh, time constraint, maybe we'll split that for the next session. Yeah, so yeah. now I mean, maybe the we last just... thing I want I want to show still, because uh, it's kind of fi funny, it fits to this persona thing. It's just yeah, one sure. thing. Um, but uh, we can then go beyond and, and do uh, some productive search to or exploration. So what you can do is now we, we introduce this new, like, uh, so we have a, just a terminal window here in this swim shell. This is basically our entire terminal um, extension, if you want. So it's basically just like wraps around your existing terminal. And now I just, because it's funny, co connected to this persona style thing, 
uh, you can basically also give it a style, a persona if you want. So like a brick shell, if you want. So like a Rick and Morty shell. And then, then you can start, uh, you know, apart from basic auto-completion stuff and so on, you can, you know, ask it about, I don't know, how to open a file and, and uh, then it will just simply reply to that. But obviously you can uh, ask it more sophisticated questions and maybe like uh, down the line with some other files attached. I don't know uh, if there is something in here. Uh, yeah, let's do this, whatever. Um, and then basically it will basically use, you know, the, the prompting. So we augmented the shell basically with entire symbolic AI features where we have, let's say, text-based LLM prompts and then we can combine them with, with you know, files and so on, exploring files. And of course, the persona style of replying, oh boy, let's take a, a stroll through your, <laughs> you know, keystroke history. Uh, Morty, like basically is Rick and Morty style and then you get basically some uh, funny so ways. You can have your, your terminal insult back at you. <laughs> exactly. You can have it in soft yeah. part, you can have it in whatever ways you you you, you want. Um, and uh, you can, you know, do some some exploration right now. And what you can do is all the, the stuff that you nice. saw before indexing and so on, all that we talked already once. Uh, you can, you know, use indexers. I, I, use I think we will stuff. definitely uh, yeah. we'll go through this uh, terminal or command prompt stuff in detail uh, in another session because it's a lot of cool stuff you can just do with natural text in this uh, shell so we just leave it here as a teaser mm -hmm. so we'll continue yes. this another time yeah. and yeah cool i cool. actually got to go already but uh, thanks so much for sharing uh what you have done i i think symbolic ai has started from a small project to something really big right now with all the conversational agents uh, extraction of documents from pdf Basically, a lot of stuff that Langchain can do, Symbolic AI would be able to do as well. And, even and with more. only two people. Only <laughs> two people. This is worth saying. So yes. uh, as usual, please, I uh, will link the GitHub repo. Please uh, help to like and uh, use it. I think if you want an off-the-shelf rack across any website, you can just use it. It just works like that. Uh, you, you probably need to clean your OpenAI key and so on. Yes. But it basically is an in-house stuff that is already built. So you can do um, all this and more. And yeah, let's uh, look forward to the terminal one to show you what you can do with terminal and GPT power, powering your terminal. So quite interested to see that. And yeah, we'll look at that the next time we, we meet. All right. And Thank yeah, you, John. So signing off. Okay, bye, everyone. Thanks, John. Bye, bye. everyone.